Great, thank you. Yeah, but I'll just introduce you. <laughs> All right, so I am happy to introduce these two wonderful professors that I had the opportunity to have a class with. Um, so first is uh, Dr. John Stein. He's a senior lecturer in the neuroscience department, um, receiving his PhD in physiology at Brown University. Um, he is involved in teaching and advising at Brown. Um, he is working with science educators and local professionals to advance the state of science education in Rhode Island. And also here with us is uh, Professor Steve, Steven Sabonik. Um, he is an independent experimental animator. Um, he has received his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Film from UCLA and a Master of Fine Arts in Experimental Animation from California Institute of Arts. And he is an animation teacher here at RISD. <laughs> Um, he is in production on a series of animated films based on American Tall Tale characters, um, which is supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship, a research fellowship at the American Antiqui Antiquarian Society, and a RISCO Fellowship. So, um, proud to introduce them. Um, and I think that first we're going to um, kind of have a discussion on their class that called Communicating Science Through Visual Media. So, um, so we'll both introduce this, but I'll just uh, start by saying that uh, John and I have been co-teaching this course for about five years. Uh, it's called Communicating Science Through Visual Media. And um, uh, we thought we would um, uh, just give a brief introduction to our work together, um, uh, because that's actually how we ended up here. Um, so the course is really designed uh, to bring together uh, artists, animators, graphic designers, and, um, and students of uh, science, various fields of science, uh, and science education. The students come together, they, um, they develop uh, projects based on topics that they research themselves, um, and then they develop scripts and visual approaches to explaining these concepts. So the course is really um, a production course in which the students learn by doing and teach by doing. So. Yeah, I think one of the sort of uh, reasons I immediately, when this was discussed as an option, uh, an idea, I immediately jumped on the idea because um, teaching science for years and years, you find yourself animating your body in front of class to teach concepts. And um, after going like this for years and years to try to describe what happens microscopically when a muscle cell shortens you then look and you say, oh, okay, there's something online now where there's an animation that kind of visualizes something that you just can't visualize with your own eyes because you can't see it. Um, so this idea of taking something that's sort of hard to understand, it's hard to visualize, and using animation as a tool to allow us to sort of visualize at least one rendition of what might be happening was sort of very interesting from the get-go. Um, and space is sort of one of those things. I mean. Uh, there's certain things we see, you know, we're, we're highly visual creatures. We invest heavily in a visual system. Uh, and there's certain things we can see, but what we can see is based on sort of what the physical limitations are of our eyeballs and our focusing power, but also what we've learned to see by experiencing the world. So you can create things like microscopes and telescopes to th see things that are beyond our vision, both small and large. and you can use things like mathematics. I don't know if uh, I wasn't here for Jan's talk about space and dark matter, but you can use mathematics to maybe visualize things that you can't see. Um, but the idea of trying to teach these concepts um, and not having sort of a good sort of visual or a way of communicating in that manner immediately jumped out as a, as a brilliant idea. And then hearing Steve talk about what animation is used for, how you can, you can basically bring people anywhere with uh, with your, with your product was just sort of a perfect fit. So we thought what we might do uh, is start by actually showing you an example of uh, some of the, of the work that's been produced in the course. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, let's see. So the... Yeah. So... As I said, we've been doing this course for about five years. Uh, we t typically teach it only in the fall. And, um, and the topics have really ranged uh, across the board. Um, the students uh, propose 
projects. We then have a discussion about them. Oh, it looks great on this screen. And, um, uh, and then uh, through the process of refining the script, they refine their approach to the, uh, to the topic. Um, so we thought we'd show you one example. They really, they range, the topics range broadly, but we'll show you one example just to give you an idea of the product of this kind of work. Uh, and that'll give you, a, I think, a, a um, nothing yet. System preferences. That's okay. If it doesn't work, we can actually dance it. John and I can, we're very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, hopefully there's sound too. Uh, you want to do some that? Uh, sure, sure. Um, so the topic here was um, a process that's occurring. It occurs during development in your brain. It occurs pretty much every day, every minute, every second of your life in your brain. This idea that. We're all born with neurons. I mean, if you, if you take a human neuron, a fruit fly neuron, or you know, a mouse neuron, throw them in the dish, they're all the same. They behave the same. They use electricity and chemicals to send information. But what's different, what makes sort of humans unique in how we behave is how those neurons are wired together.
and how those connections are made, how those connections are broken. The whole idea of um, sort of rewiring networks in your brain. It's, it's nothing you can really observe just with your naked eye. A lot of people have, don't have access to a microscope to understand this. So the goal here was to pick a, a very young audience, like middle school aged kids on end up, and communicate this idea of what happens in your brain when you are learning or experiencing things. You look at a cup of coffee, you see a cup of coffee. But what if when you looked at a cup of coffee, your eye sent signals to the auditory center of your brain? Not only would you see the coffee, you'd start hearing things too. How distracting. Now imagine how confusing an entire city would be with all of this overlapping sensory information. Well, this might actually happen if we didn't have synaptic pruning. What is synaptic pruning? Inside your brain there are interconnected groups of neurons called neural networks. The neurons communicate through synapses. Let's look under a microscope. Scientists are able to isolate brain cells in a dish and observe them over time moving and communicating with one another. The synapse is where this communication happens. When you're a baby, you have a lot of these synapses. In fact, you have too many. As you develop into adulthood, your brain has to prune away the weaker synapses in order to function efficiently. This is what we call synaptic pruning. Now, let's imagine your brain as a densely populated city with billions of buildings, each one connected to every other with its own separate road. This city looks like your brain when you were a baby. Too many connections! In fact, this is what scientists call hyperconnectivity, and it is one chaotic place. This city needs some pruning! But how do we know which synapses to get rid of and which to keep? Imagine you're driving to school, trying to navigate these tiny separate roads. It would be difficult at first, but eventually you find the fastest route and take that path each day. Your friends see how fast you're getting to school and decide to follow you. Soon all the kids in the neighborhood are taking the same road and there's too much traffic. The city needs to widen and strengthen this road to move all the traffic along efficiently. The brain does the same thing with synapses between neurons that are sending lots of messages back and forth. The more the pathway is used, the stronger the connection. And what happens to all those tiny streets you no longer use to get to school? We don't need them anymore, so let's remove that asphalt. This is when synaptic pruning comes into play. Your brain adapts, removing the connections it isn't using anymore. As the cells in your eyes send more and more messages to the visual processing center of your brain, those connections are strengthened. Meanwhile, the connections from your eyes to the auditory center of the brain are pruned away. So information from your eyes is processed only visually. A big part of efficient synaptic pruning is keeping the proper balance. If not enough pruning occurs, the brain stays hyperconnected, as it was when you were a baby. This hyperconnectivity has been observed in some cases of autism, which could be related to the feeling of being overwhelmed when processing chaotic environments. On the other hand, with too much pruning, communication within and between neural networks is disrupted. This results in impaired cognitive function, such as memory loss, typically observed in Alzheimer's disease. In a city with too much pruning, roadblocks pop up on your route to school, causing you to be late or making it impossible to get there. As it happens in the brain, this loss of synapses makes it hard to access memories and blocks certain paths of communication. While the largest period of synaptic pruning is early in life, this process continues throughout adulthood. So keep learning and happy pruning. Did you know that each of our brains contains more than a quadrillion synapses? That's over 100,000 times the number of people on Earth. And just think, you have all these connections to thank for your brain's efficient processing. Okay, so that's one example. <laughs> and, uh, whoops. You look at a cup of coffee. You we already looked at a cup of coffee, so we won't do that again. Um, but that's one example of the, of the kind of work that the students are doing in the course. And, um, uh, and, and just to sort of break this down a little bit, they, they're, re, they're picking a topic, they're proposing topics, then they are refining the topics, they're uh, forming teams around these topics that, that should include both um, artists and, 
and, uh, and students who are familiar with the science on some level. Uh, they're also developing a visual script as well as a written script. Uh, they're working with, uh, with mentors who are uh, specialists in, the air, in some related area to their topic. Um, and then they're actually producing the work. Um, and all of this with weekly feedback on, on, uh, on what they're doing. So it's actually a multi-pronged um, activity that they're involved in. And when, um, when the idea of this conference came up and the idea was space, um, well, the video talks about the space between your neurons, so there's that. But there's also this idea of, of the kind of spaces that the students are working with as they produce these projects. They're working, uh, they're working in actually a number of different um, pedagogical spaces uh, that are related to both the science and the visualization. Um, and I also would actually just propose this idea that there is this space that exists between the visuals and the script and the soundtrack, uh, those three things, that there's a space between them and the space, the things that are sort of missing uh, between them actually become just as important as the things which are articulated. Um, so when we see something and we hear something and they don't exactly line up, our brain is able to fill that space with a, uh, potentially a deeper understanding of the, um, of the subject. So, um, so that's an example. I don't know if you want to add anything else. I'll just say, um like, like all research projects, it is heavily involved in research. Uh, the amount of information they, they learn is many times more than what actually ends up going into the script or going into the visuals uh, of the animation. So, and uh, that's another thing to learn. It's a hard thing to learn. What do you keep and what do you throw away? You've learned all this really neat stuff, but you have to prune it down uh, to deliver sort of content to a particular group. So there's a tremendous amount of learning in both directions. The, the amount of science is learned is really uh, at a very high level, and a lot, and or certainly the amount of animation, artistic skills learned is uh, tremendous as well. So there's conceptual pruning as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's an introduction uh, to what we do. Um, in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, uh, the specifics. The, again, this happens over the course of one semester, so there's approximately um, three to four weeks of concept development, and then the rest of the time is spent in production. Um, but even when they're involved in the production, the, the uh, process of making the work is continually refining um, the message that they're trying to get across. So the, the, um, the, the process of making the work actually um, continues to be a learning process and a teaching process. I think one of the best examples of that was the first year with the penguin physics, where there was a particularly challenging physical principle of torque, which is a big stump, so a stumbling block for a lot of students. And uh, we were working on, they, the students were working on different approaches to this, and they actually took it to a student who was actually looking for tutoring help for that particular topic. So it was a student taking physics, and they worked on it with them as a focus group or an audience and gave them feedback on a better way to visualize this, uh, this difficult concept that would help, that help them. So, you know, finding focus groups is always useful and having the class as a focus group is, is also useful from week to week, so. Yeah, um, so I think uh, we should probably take some questions. Uh, that's a great thing. <laughs> time. So if anybody has any questions. So can you tell me a bit more about the people who end up taking the course, the students? Yeah, well, it, it started um, as a, a collaboration, sort of. It's, it, the whole thing idea, actually, the idea came from students. There were uh, students that wanted to sort of use animation skills and, and, and maybe formalize it with a course, a way to, to um, you know, make it more of a discipline. So we were approached by, it was Dave Target and Richard Fishman, um, and, and said, well, a collaborative course, bringing animation and science education together is sort of the idea. And that's kind of what started the course. So it's always been 
um, more or less a 50-50 split between uh, Brown Science students or students with animation interests uh, and RISD animation students uh, and also non-animation students, uh, graphic uh, design. There's been a, a number of different groups, but sort of a balance between the two. Yeah, I'm trying to remember that, that particular video, there were three students, I think. Uh, do you, there was Denali. Um, So that was uh, Elizabeth Evans, Denali Schmidt, and Alexandra Urban. So Denali Schmidt was um, the one RISD student in that team, and she was a film uh, major at RISD. Uh, Elizabeth and Alexandra were both Brown students. I think Elizabeth was actually a graduate student. Is that right? My memories. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> too much synaptic pruning. Um, and Alexandra Urban, I think, was interested in um, science and society or uh, science education. So they, they typically come from, um, we've had students, uh, we've had physics students, we've had um, uh, a lot of uh, biological science students come into the course. I'm thinking about the Brown students. Um, a few graduate students. Um, um, they primarily have come from uh, biological sciences and interest in science education, um, with a few other sciences mixed in. And then the, um, and the RISD students primarily come from film, and that's actually by design, uh, because to produce a project like this in one semester, you just need to come in sort of you know, hitting the ground running. We also have uh, teaching assistants who are have either taken the course or are well trained in, in film so that they can actually teach and assist the students in the production. I was surprised at the things I was completely un unaware of that go into to actually making a production, which is, you know, the, well, the teamwork, but also the uh, production schedule, which Steve is very good at reminding the students. Of, said, lay out your plan, because doing this in one semester I, is not typical, I guess, to, to sort of have a finished product researched planned, developed, and sort of produced uh, in such a short period of time. Right. Yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah. I was just curious if you, uh, okay. uh, would, for instance, take the same subject, but uh, sort of experiment with uh, two different audiences, as in sort of a higher level of, of information being delivered. I was also curious about, you know, say this is for middle school consumption, and do you, do you, are you able to get it into a middle school? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, um, we, we actually have had one, video. we're producing these just as educational yeah. exercises, but um, uh, it was actually this was piece. This one. Yeah. It was actually this animation. Um, they're online. Anybody can see them. And, and we were contacted by a consulting firm in Chile uh, that provides material to the Chilean public school system. And they wanted to use this animation in the Chilean public schools as part of an education on drug use. <laughs> um, so as far as I know, it's being used or was used yeah. at least for a period of time in public schools, but not through our efforts. We were just contacted. But it would be great if we Yeah, were. some of the ones, like the penguin physics was targeted at somebody taking college-level physics or maybe a high school t student taking AP physics. Um, but another approach is to, uh, I, I, I don't know, I call it speaking in scientific tongues. You take a simple subject and you present it in a way that, you know, middle school students or high school students can understand it, but you add enough additional information, tidbits, that makes it more interesting to a broader audience, too. So you can kind of pitch it to multiple audiences. There may be some, you know, high school educated folks that didn't know much about this, and even though it's kind of a funny or, you know, uh, way of presenting it, they may learn something from it themselves just by watching it. 
But the audience, the, the choice of the audience is actually a big part of the design process. So um, John referred to the penguin physics, we call it penguin physics because there were penguins in the animation. But it was uh, directly um, targeting uh, undergraduate students in a physics course. Uh, so it, the, the, the audience is really dependent on, on, the, on the student's choice of their target audience. Did, yeah, go ahead. I would just say one of the more difficult ones, uh, I remember the discussion on, on the target audience was one that was trying to debunk some of the rumors or the myths about immunizations and autism. And when they researched the videos that were online or, or the clips that were online, the people speaking, you know, saying, no, there's, there's no scientific, scientific evidence to support this, were almost condescending. Almost like, if you're even thinking about this, you're a fool. And immediately, if you're trying to reach an audience, someone who knows maybe a little bit and is looking into this, if you're hit with that approach, it might sort of immediately turn you off. So the idea was, you know, who do you want to reach? Do you want to preach to the choir or do you want to reach, you know, your target audience, which are somebody that might be on the cusp of making the decision one way or the other? Yeah, so that, were, that was a big part of that discussion. The lady from who headed CDC came up for a Make It Better conference, which is all about uh, uh, public health in her case, but actually the whole conference was about uh, medical. And she was sort of almost begging the students to produce more uh, visual, you know, different uh, uh, animations or almost any kind of visuals to help spread uh, public health uh, it, uh, messages or mm -hmm. issues. So that's, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a huge, I mean, it, it changed the whole design of the project um, because it was easy to think about just preaching, but to actually try to communicate was <laughs> right. <laughs> a whole other kettle of fish. Did you have a question? Yeah, we have time for one last question, so if we do have one. Thanks. So, let's see. In, in my field uh, of science, now there are YouTube channels of people taking the, you know, the top five papers from our conferences and doing like two minute videos on them. And they're extremely popular. Things, well, I work in like computer graphics or machine learning, things like that. Um, and I wondered if you'd seen these and if you'd thought about, I mean, in this instance, somebody is monetizing this idea of uh, science communication. Uh, you could turn this into a, you know, great scheme to get some cash for Brown. <laughs> so I've seen, you know, there's two minute physics, there's. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, they're all popular. I mean, some of them follow a similar kind of format, sort of really fast-paced, pithy, you know, fast-moving, you know, and, and that's, that's a discussion we have as well. It, it, you, don't, you don't want to lose the audience, but if you're doing it like this, watching it like a movie, the audience can't pause, rewind, and play it again, or go back and go over something that they didn't quite catch everything. But if it's something that you can control yourself, then maybe you can go a little faster. And because uh, people have the option of going back, and and I think that's kind of what those the two minute physics ones are, like it's very fast paced, and that's now a lot of students learn this way. Um, I don't know, it's like two x, they learn at two x speed because they'll watch a taped lecture, they'll play it at two x speed. Yeah, and then if something they don't quite get, then they'll slow it over back and put it at one x speed and watch you say it in normal language. So, um, yeah, I mean, thinking about how the viewer, what control the viewer has over what they're looking at can influence how you deliver the content visually and script-wise, yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, I, it's not a question of what I think. It just is a fact that, that uh, people are using graphics and animation to uh, convey and to absorb all kinds of information. Um, it's just... 
as fluid and as flexible as text. Uh, you know, people take both and give both just sort of all the time. So going online to do the two-minute physics or whatever um, is just another way of absorbing the information. So what we're trying to do here, I think, uh, is, uh, is help students to sort of understand a little bit about the language uh, of doing that. Uh, because I think more and more, you know, we live in a world that's just filled with all kinds of moving visual images and sound and text. Um, it's not a world in which we just go to a textbook anymore. So, so yeah, so that's, and, you know, and some of the students who go through this may end up, you know, making uh, a living from it. <laughs> a few of our possible. alums have gone on to um, SciTunes, yeah. which is at the library, uh, the science library. And we've had graduates who have gone on to do um, uh, science education through various organizations. There was one student who, was working for a diabetes organization yeah. up in Boston and uh, doing um, um, visual communication, you know, that way. All right, so thank you very much. Um, uh, now we'll have, I think, Diego um, present our last um, panel for the day. <laughs>